what we do here is go back, 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 back. Uh, for those that don't know, I know there's some of those in before that's probably going to come in, but my name's Ian Tyson. I'm with the uh, Just Us League. Um, <laughs> that's uh, myself and Jeremy and Brad. We do a lot of the panel hosting and, uh, and our own panels uh, here at GenreCon, and we also uh, host the Forest City Comic Con in London. And so I'm thrilled to once again uh, be hosting the panel today with, uh, with Vince, uh, Vince Casso, and we're excited. Casso or Queso? Casso. Casso, that's what I thought. Queso yeah. is cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so, but I had a moment of doubt in my mind. That yeah, I honestly, most folks say queso, so really? I'm glad you did. No. Well, it would be delicious if you were, but you're not. So yeah. um, today's panel, I don't know if uh, were any of you at yesterday's panel with Vince in here? Okay. Yeah, I used to. Uh, yeah. you, you were? Okay. So we will, uh, we'll try not to go over the same ground, but today's panel, uh, we're going to be talking about making a living in geek culture, which is something that you have been fortunate enough to do, and yeah. uh, obviously the rise of of geek culture and you know in new media like we were discussing yesterday has uh, has really become quite large and so maybe talk about your journey as far as maybe what got you into geek culture right start there and then we'll we'll see where we go well yeah I mean it's not to reiterate too much over yesterday but in terms of my start in geek culture most of that was tied to me getting you know, because prior to that, I mean, I've been a gamer my whole life. Like I've, I've played stuff. I've you know done what anyone would. But to actually be working within that industry and that that uh, subculture itself, the guilds was started that. I didn't realize there was such a pull toward that as an interest or such a community built around that until the show became popular with like the WoW crowd, with the Comic Con types of crowds, etc. And then doing the con circuits, uh, it became real, like, oh my god, there's a lot of people who are into this. Uh, and yeah, that's really how it started. Thanks. Awesome. So, you said you were a gamer before, so, like, with PS3 games, like video games? Yeah, kind mostly of thing. consoles and PC. I love RTS games, um, a lot of RPGs, that kind of thing. I had not really played any uh, tabletop, really. I mean, like, you know, like, like pen and paper games. Like, they're, they're, <laughs> the real deal. Uh, actually, my first ever game of D&D &D was toward the end of last year. Oh, wow. I had never played D&D &D before, so I've got like four or five D campaigns going now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so mostly just, you know, entry level stuff, very surface level stuff, and then attending these conventions and being steeped in the world, you then come to see how much depth there really is. That's interesting. Now you made an interesting distinction when you said I wasn't really in geek culture. I mean, I was a gamer. So there's that. Did you find that a lot? That there's people that yeah, like yeah, I play video games, but like I'm not I'm not a geek. I'm not part of that that world kind of thing. You see? Well, you see a line drawn there. Well, I feel like there's different elements of geekdom, and sure. in the sense that you know I don't believe in like gatekeeping or anything like that. It's ridiculous. But if you are as a consumer, you know you play the AAA game titles. You watch the Marvel movies, and that's like the level that you are comfortable at. Well, you are still interested in geeky topics. Those things are absolutely part of the world. But you know that's a, a different from someone who's, for example, been you know collecting the comics since 1960, or who you know knows the A to Z of the lore of Waterdeep, or you know all that kind of stuff. It's there's different elements and different subsections that you can sort of devote yourself to, but to begin with, I was very just surface level. You know, there were things that I was kind of really into, but, you know, to begin with, it's just, I play a game because I'm having fun playing this game, and I watch a movie because it's a fun movie, and I don't think too much harder about it. But then being exposed to all this and seeing what was there, gets your interest peaked to actually dig deeper and look harder and find what you are actually really into and there will be something like that for everybody at least one thing that you're like okay so I'm all about that right so what were the what were the first things that drew you when you when you started to get immersed in, in geek culture what were the things that really grabbed you and you're like I think I want to dig into this a little bit more and the things that that evolved for you that way yeah for sure well I think no matter what you know what, what IP we're talking about, I'm always, I've always been a lore nerd. Like, yeah. I'm all about story, 
which is why, you know, hitherto I had already always played uh, RPG titles and things like that. So, uh, one of my first uh, big obsessions, like gaming-wise, were Blizzard titles. I've been playing Blizzard games since the, you know, like the mid-90s, late-90s with StarCraft and all that, and realizing how much they committed to the story, um, Chris, uh, Chris Metzen, the, uh, the lead creative director over there for a long time, uh, developed these worlds that were just so incredibly deep and more so than they ever needed to be for an RTS game. Like, it was just, it was uncalled for. But, but it was amazing. Like, he put so much work into ensuring the detail and the lore and the depth of history and richness was there. And so that's what started getting into, like, oh, there's all of these worlds out there, whether it's, you know, StarCraft or Dungeons and Dragons or uh, Avatar The Last Airbender or any other thing you could possibly be into, someone has really committed the time to building a world around that. And getting into these worlds was that first big interest of mine. Like, oh, what, what stories are being told? Because that's also what I do as a writer, is, you know, world building is huge for me. Being able to, to develop something that's extremely complex, I love. Awesome. So what, what are your, your big things? I know you just started playing D&D, &D, but what are the, the main things that you use? It's still the, the games and the world building, other stuff within geek culture that's really, uh, really spoken to you? Yeah. It's definitely evolved because especially these days I've found myself with a lot less time to be able to actually play video games sure. and what have you. So, you know, I make <clears throat> I make the time where I can to catch up on my backlog. Uh, but these days I've come to actually transition a lot into uh, tabletop RPGs where you can tell your own story. And that's you know, I'm gonna start DMing pretty soon because again it's all for me, it's all about building the world. Right. And so even as a player I find myself, you know, Sitting back and going, well, I'm having fun playing this game, but I wish I could be just like constructing this narrative a bit more. So I'm definitely going to take the DMC and then go from there. But yeah, I mean, playing D and D, playing Vampire: The Masquerade, playing Outbreak and Dead, and learning how these game systems dictate the way you have to interact with this completely fictional world and how immersed you can really feel in that has become a new, very profound interest. Cool. So then, you're. Through, through the guild, you kind of fall into this, this world, this universe, and now, as we alluded to yesterday with, with new media and everything else, so how do you find the way you're able to make a living within geek culture? Like what, what was, what's your path, what do you, where do you see the path going in terms yeah. of being able to make a living at all of this stuff that we all love so much? Now, that's a fascinating subject because, especially these days, we talked yesterday a bit about new media and about the ability to develop and get a show out there, the routes you can take on that, and how the relative competitiveness and saturation of the field plays a role in the way in which you have to move carry forward on that. The, there is absolutely a sort of saturation of geekdom these days, but it's in the sense that the popularity of that as an interest has exploded so much and I feel it exploded disproportionate to the number of people who are working in the field. There's a lot of room to actually find your niche right now. And I'm really close friends with a lot of people who are, you know, comics writers. Um, you know, B. Dave Walters and Jody Hauser. Uh, Jody Hauser now, who is, you know, go to a comic store, close your eyes and grab one. There's a really good chance she wrote it. And so these days, yeah, people who had just been, you know, an everyday nerd of yesteryear, are finding themselves able to just like find their niche and all of a sudden they work in this industry. Whereas before, the idea of being a comics writer was, it's a little bit less relatable or approachable. It's like, okay, well, some people do that, but that's not really like a career. Like, right. the, there's that, yeah, there's that feeling that it's a nerdy thing, but it's like those people do other stuff too. And, you know, sure, I mean, everyone still moonlights to some degree, but. These are now honestly got careers, and people who are writers who, you know, uh, see themselves as as uh, narrative fiction storytellers can find a place to, you know, to hang up a shingle. And myself as a performer, primarily an actor, all of a sudden I find myself, in addition to any live action or voiceover work that I do, my schedule is filled on a week to week, month to month basis with live RPG shows. 
the genre that I wouldn't even have imagined would have existed prior to all this. I didn't even think that would have been a thing. But we can now get paid to sit at a table <laughs> and play a tabletop RPG game, like, you know, Critical Role, or LA by Night, or War Alive Frontier, and tell a story with an insanely high production value, with full effects and a full crew, and tell a story with just as much integrity as, you know, a major uh, plotted out network television show. But it's people at a table playing an RPG. So it's freaking wild. It's a magical time. It is. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting to me too. I'm, I'm endlessly fascinated. We, we touched on Twitch a little bit yesterday and we yeah. were talking as well. And just that, because I remember we're going back maybe five years ago, my ex-girlfriend's son, no, her daughter's boyfriend, Six Degrees, we'll, we'll get there. He was early days of Twitch. He was playing I don't even know what game. But he's like, yeah, I get I, I get checks every month because I go on Twitch and people follow, 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 watch my stuff and I get paid. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> and he was 17 yeah, years wild. old and he was making bank. Like he had a part-time job and then he'd just get these checks because he did very well in the games and a lot of people watch it. So the whole fact that, like, really, like you were saying, some people would look at you, look, you tell them something that you do and you're like, wait, that's your job? Like that's, it's fascinating. So. What, what do you think the sustainability, I know you said there's not even really, there's plenty of room for people to come in, but what's the sustainability of, the, of some of those models in well, terms so of moving forward? Yeah, for sure. The question you kind of have to ask yourself is what demand is that meaning? What market demand are we fulfilling? And as long as there is a demand for entertainment in that form, and again, like with the explosion of these nerdy interests overall over the last, you know, five, ten years, uh, there's absolutely a massive amount of demand to see other people being into what you're into and playing it at a high level. Uh, the same way that, you know, a person watches uh, sports, you know, like you tune in the Super Bowl, what have you. These people want to see uh, faces they're familiar with, people they look up to or celebrities or what have you, uh, engaged in something that they can relate to, something that they enjoy, but they enjoy being played at a high level. And that's, in my opinion, why, you know, Critical Role took off the way it did, why our shows are doing so well, is because, you know, people have been playing Vampire the Masquerade, the game system since, I don't know, the 1980s. Uh, it's been around. D&D, uh, obviously, forever. <laughs> uh, so it's always existed. I played D&D back when I was in high school when the Earth was cooling. And you yeah. know, way back then. So yeah, early, early. I played what was the, what was that module? It was a vampire castle one. And, uh, whatever. It terrified me. But Raven uh, good times. Ravenloft. Ravenloft. Castle Ravenloft. Well that done. <laughs> nice pull. That uh, that was a terrifying, uh, terrifying module. Those yeah. good times. But uh, yeah, it's been around forever. It's but now, like I'm, I'm constantly amazed. Yeah. Like my kids, that are who are 21 and 23, play D and D. My 20, 21 year old runs a all girls D and D club and a weekly game at university, and I love that. And it's yeah. amazing to me. But so okay, there's these games that you're talking about, and now people are able to to make money at it. So again, what's the what is there a saturation point? Do you think? Well, the thing is, I, I feel like people need to start looking at live gaming content like that the same way that you do look at like physical sports. Okay, because you're really satisfying the same kind of need, which is, you know, there's a reason why, you know, high schools and colleges have these sport clubs, why they have teams, why people tune in to ESPN to watch football or tennis or whatever. You enjoy watching people who are good at doing that thing, do that thing at a high level. You enjoy the competitive aspect, you find someone you can root for, etc. Now, while, while tabletop RPGs aren't necessarily a team sport, they're not like a, com a competition, you can still appreciate the fact that you know how these rules work, you know that there's a game being played, and you get to watch people who are good at doing that explore their dexterity in playing that game. So really, as far as like the brain is considered, you're fulfilling the same basic desire as a professional sport event would. And so it's an area of entertainment that I feel has been grossly underrepresented because I feel like people, to some degree, whether they knew it or not, 
have always wanted to see that kind of thing. If they were into D&D, if they were into uh, hip hop gaming, they've always wanted to see that. But now we're really getting people actually making that kind of content. This is also, in my opinion, why eSports took off the way that it has. Because again, I love playing StarCraft, so I absolutely watch the competitive play. I enjoy watching people who are infinitely better than I will ever be just rock out as Protoss and clean the floor with somebody else. I go to BlizzCon every year down in Anaheim in California, and I watch WCS, the championships in StarCraft, uh, in this beautiful, just massive stadium with all the bells and whistles, and it's just mind-blowing. But there's a market for it, because people who are into an activity like that want to see it done at a high level. True for sports, true for gaming, true for anything. And so I don't feel like there really is a saturation point. We've proven that there's a lot of people willing to watch. As long as we give them things to watch and platforms to do it on and get increasingly inventive and innovative along that line, it's going to continue to grow as an industry. And do you feel that it's getting more mainstream acceptance now? Absolutely. I mean, to this day, I'll be, I don't know, anywhere, anywhere from, I'll be moving around online somewhere, and someone will drop, you know, a critical role reference. And, go, and then it'll just get piled on comments. And I'm like, this is incredible. Like, this is a massive show. And it's about like Dungeons and Dragons, what was thought to be some sort of closeted, nerdy kind of activity for decades is now something that anyone can pile on to and enjoy. And we have anecdotes of, of people who have really no connection to you know, greater nerddom, but who appreciate uh, people telling a good story jumping on the show. A friend of mine actually just shot a, um, he shot a thing with uh, his mom, his like, you know, 60 year old mom and all of her like little buddies throwing down a game of D&D. They're all like, you know, these 60 something year old women just having fun and doing all the voices and what have you. So there's, that's the thing is there's a level of acceptance and there's a level of approachability to D&D specifically uh, where anyone can really tell a story. The rules themselves are remarkably simple if you just sort of like get into it and commit to playing a role. And that's why I think it has that much room to grow. So would you see the, the example that, that pops into my head because I never in my lifetime thought we'd be, we'd be at this point where they televise poker tournaments. Right. That to me is astounding. Like you're watching people play cards for crying out loud. And people are in, in a, again, in a state of freaking out. So would you ever, see that we would get to a point where to the same level as say, you know, poker stuff is, is being televised on networks, that we would have maybe a D&D &D tournament at that level, televised, people watching. I know it's been talked about. Uh, I know, uh, who was it, was just the coach, one of the, the big companies, had considered trying to tournamentalize D&D. &D. Like, see if we can turn this into like a competitive sport almost in the same way that you'd see with like poker or Magic the Gathering competitions or sure. like that. Not quite sure how they would do it, uh, but I know there is absolutely interest there to see the stakes increase and to try and get it to like, yeah, like a competitive structure. Uh, I, I feel that's kind of a tough thing to do with an inherently like narrative story-based sure. game. Uh, but then, you know, we've also got pitches for shows that involve, uh, Taking uh, Dungeons and Dragons concepts like you know GMing and things like that, and turning that into sort of like a competition, that's <laughs> GM, kind of things like that. So there's a lot of stuff in the works right now to take D and D, take tabletop gaming, and marry them with mainstream concepts to get them out into the world in a way that is now relatable to an increasing audience of people. Sure. So what do you think then is the, I suppose for lack of a better term, special sauce? That can make something just hit and connect. I mean, I think in the last, you know, think about it in the last couple of years with the emergence and just insanity of Fortnite and how the, this game just comes out and it's just suddenly, and like I had heard of Fortnite, Fortnite, and then you know, especially with somebody working in high school, so I was like, like everybody's playing about Fortnite. What the? What are they talking? And now it's just every biggest game in the world, biggest right game now. in the world, and like. You know, hip hop artists and uh, you know Alfonso Ribeiro are suing them for stealing their dances and stuff like that because yeah. they're making money off of it. What do you think the, in, in your mind, just from your experience and the things that you've seen, that special sauce is that would just kind of help something to connect in that way? 
Good question. Um, I feel like, well, I feel like the thing that Fortnite has that a lot of games didn't, the reason why it's so successful is because it took an extremely familiar concept of this sort of battle royale kind of game style. Uh, it had very approachable graphics. It didn't lean too heavily into the realism like PUBG did. Um, didn't lean too heavily into an overly cartoonish aesthetic. But it was just approachable enough for a broad enough age range of people. The mechanics were simple enough to learn. And then they kept always, to this day, always changing the game. Always new items, new map, new change here to, to this event. They just had a concert in the game with Marshmallow, mm -hmm. the EDM artist, did a concert in game, which was super cool, by the way. <laughs> it was actually really awesome. Um, but yeah, they found ways to continually make it more interesting so you could never get used to it. Um, and that's one thing that I think was really big. And that's also a trait that I feel is inherent to these tabletop gaming shows. Because the same reason that you'd watch a show on like the CW, or just like high drama and intrigue, you watch LA by night, and since we're all just improving our asses off, the story is going to take some turns, and you, none of us knows what's going to happen next. And so that's the thing, is you can't get used to it, you can't really get bored of it because it's an evolving story, it's an evolving world always being told. Now how that takes the next step and would break into broad mainstream acceptance, that's a little tougher because obviously you are still dealing with people who are sitting around a table playing an RPG. Sure. It's not a highly visual medium, and people may be used to that. Uh, so how that will happen, if it does, I'm not sure. I'm also perfectly content for it to remain somewhat niche, because as it stands right now, we're drawing incredible numbers, and the community built around it is fantastic. And that's one thing that I also like about the tabletop gaming industry in this world, is that it has a much, much more deep and profound sense of community. Whereas you can interact very directly with your viewers. It, it's not the distance of like network TV, for example. We're in there in the chat on Twitter, what have you, talking with people who view the show. We get fan art directly sent to us. Uh, so that sense of intimacy, I would hope, never leaves. But finding the balance between that, keeping it, you know, in the family, sort of, but also finding those larger, more mainstream audiences, that's the balance we have to strike. Right. Well, I mean, you, and I, when you think about just gaming, with, be it tabletop or, or video gaming, and you look at that, uh, trying to translate things into mainstream, the two examples I think is the Dungeons and Dragons movie. Right. That was <laughs> questionable at best. That was a movie. That was a movie, period, end of sentence. <laughs> um, and then you look at Warcraft, which, yeah. and maybe this is an interesting thing to ask you and what you've seen as well, is Warcraft, I mean, tepidly received maybe in North America. It did some decent numbers, but overseas, <coughs> like, was huge overseas. Yeah. I think it made the vast majority of its money in China. And, and you'll find finding that more and more with movies like Aquaman did, did, didn't do as good numbers in North America as The Dark Knight did, but when you add in its global, it made almost 70% of its money overseas. So with some of these more, you know, living in, in geek world, some of these things do better. How do they translate? And like, as far as overseas, and what is that kind of the key, or like around the world? What do you see with the stuff that you're working in? Good question. I know we have a lot of international viewers, and even, you know, with the Guild, we had a lot of people worldwide who were into it. Um, the way the exact numbers break down, like in terms of domestic versus international, I'm not entirely sure. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but I know the interest is there worldwide, if for no other reason than because we would do conventions in the UK, in Australia, uh, in Germany, what have you, uh, gaming conventions and such, and draw huge crowds and see turnout that you'd expect in any American convention. So people definitely have that interest there. There's no question that there's that need and desire, uh, especially because the cultural uh, the cultural differences that make certain properties harder to translate from one to another, uh, I don't feel are as much of an issue with games like these because, again, it is something a lot of people can sort of intrinsically relate to, is this storytelling aspect. And of course, if you watch a show like LA by Night, we're making lots of references to stuff in Los Angeles. The show takes place in LA in the present day. So, 
there's still that. But then again, I, you know, if you watch any Hollywood action <laughs> film, there's a lot of LA in there most yeah. of the time. So it, again, it's, it's not a difficult translation. Um, and I feel like growing internationally is absolutely a direction that it's going to go in. And that could be one, that's one of the things that helps with the traction of it. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think so. Cool. Um, and I'll, I've got other questions. We'll see, but let's uh, see if anybody in the room has some questions for you first in terms of, you know, the whole geek culture, geek dumb making a living in it, uh, the creating, creating that you're doing. Anybody in, please. It's funny uh, you mentioned uh, the, the GM competition thing. I was actually, uh, one of the finalists for... for Were the, you really? Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome! <laughs> um, but I had a question for you about um, when you were talking about people playing the game at a high level, yeah. right? And, and what, what do you consider that high level to be? Because there's been D&D podcasts for a long time. Sure. And, and one of my friends had a, a web show called Dungeon Majesty, like in the early 2000s. And it, it sort of felt a lot like what Critical Role did but it was always niche, like it never exploded and went huge like that. So I'm wondering, what, what do you think is that high level that we're seeing now that, that's catapulted that to, to sort of mainstream? Well, I think it comes down to a couple aspects. Uh, and again, it follows all the same rules as you see in, in traditional television, which is who is doing the playing, what are they playing, and how are they playing it? And so with Critical Role, they had, do have kind of this perfect storm of, of, uh, of aspects where you have these very talented voice actors, and in many cases, quite well-known voice actors, playing Dungeons and Dragons, which immediately, that can elevate the play for the viewer because they're bringing voices, they're bringing the acting dexterity to it, so they're diving deep to actually play these roles. Um, and then seeing how high you can push the production value to create that visual element that you wouldn't get from you know a home brew tabletop game, mm -hmm. uh, but without making it no longer D and D. Like obviously at a certain point, if you just push the production value and the visual shtick to its limit, you're, it's a TV show now. Like it's not really D and D anymore. You're not dealing with people sitting around playing a game, which is still fundamentally what makes it so charming. Um, so it's finding out how far you can push those uh, and getting the right kinds of people who can capture the interest of the audience and the viewers uh, and then seeing what the audience responds to because that's again what Critical Role did so well is they tell their story in an incredibly deep and immersive and entertaining way. They know how to mix in the sort of meta humor they know how to break character, they know how to be in character, they know how to work all those things that we find so interesting and charming in our own games into a medium that you're willing to watch. So for me, that and, you know, other good examples of like high-level play are things like The Stream of Many Eyes, for example, where, again, they brought out the celebrities, they upped the production value, they had a lot of guest DMs, and you could see the different ways in which the game can be played by people who you recognize, but who also, honest to God, take the game very seriously. And so, and you know, over at uh, Geek and Sundry with We're Alive Frontier and LA by Night, again, we're pushing the limits of what a tabletop game is because we have the content at the table, but for We're Alive, for example, we're actually shooting films. We're, we're doing narrative short form content, scripted films to fill in gaps in the story or to transition now, we're leading off into season three, and we have a new antagonist coming in. Oh boy. <laughs> so, not quite antagonist. Oh, don't tell anyone I said that. Um, <laughs> we have a character coming in for season three. Oh my god, they're gonna kill me. Uh, but uh, we had a whole short film that we did to introduce that character and the basic conflict they bring to the table. So again, like, and with, you know, uh, L.A. by Night, we have little stinger clips at the end of each episode that we film, pre-tape, and script that help give you a taste of story of what's coming. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, that's like the high level, is those things you couldn't necessarily do in your own home that create a richer, more embraced story. So it's like that bridge between a network TV show and a game that you can actually play yourself. Mm -hmm. It's the, those little touches that are a bit more than you could do on your own. And that's why people watch, because you know, it's, it's a heightened reality, mm -hmm. so yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody else? Any uh, questions? We uh, we won't we won't tell anybody. <laughs> good. We're all, I, I we all swear. Guys. We all swear we're going to keep that on lock. Okay. Good. Good. <laughs> anybody else? Uh, question for Vince in terms of meeting? Uh, I'm drawing a blank now. Um, I don't know. I guess for me, as just kind of like the average, <clears throat> like I have a YouTube channel and stuff, and <clears throat> I don't know. For me, like like how did you, like what was your first big break into what you're doing now? So yeah, it's what I'm doing now, which is a lot of like the live content and stuff. Um, honestly, after the guild uh, began to wind down a bit, and I was just getting other like small voiceover gigs and this kind of thing here and there, uh, Geek and Sundry started up because Geek and Sundry actually launched with season six of the guild. That's how it started, um, and so I met all those folks and uh, came to know what they were doing. And then kind of just fell off the radar for a while, was doing my own thing, and decided, like, I wonder what JNS is up to these days. Uh, went back over there, did a few charity streams. Uh, years back, we do, like, once a year, we'll do, like, a 24-hour charity stream, where we just hold, uh, stream straight for 24 hours. Um, and I, I took a shift, like, 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, I was whacked out. It was not good. Um, but I did that a few times, and I was like, I really dig this streaming thing they're doing. And by this point, they had not, they're not doing any RPG content, really. This is still a few years back. Uh, but then once Crit dropped, and I started talking to a buddy of mine over there, Ivan Van Norman, who hosts a lot of their content, and he mentioned this uh, idea he had. And by now, I had been doing appearances on some of their like live news shows, um, and other sort of like segmented appearances here and there. And I appeared a lot on their Gadier parties, the Friday show they had. Um, but he pulled me aside and he asked if I'd be interested in doing like a, a live gaming show set in this post-apocalyptic world of We're Alive. And I was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> uh, which that was in development for almost two years from that point. Uh, getting all the legal worked out, you know, getting uh, the permissions from Casey Wyland, who makes the actual show, the audio drama, developing our characters, and then we, we pulled a bunch of other super talented people into the mix, Xander Jean Array and a, few, and a lot of others, uh, until eventually we had this show. And then from there I decided, you know what, this is dope. So I just started aggressively making sure I was looked at for anything else they had going on. And now I'm on, a, I think, three of those shows, and we'll still guest and appear on a lot of others. Um, and it's, it's an interesting point how different some of the content is, because you'll do like the live gaming content, like We're Alive or LA by Night, but better than half of my appearances on the channel are also for shows like Game the Game, where we will sit down and actually demo out a new board game or something like that. It's hosted by Ivan Van Norman and Becca Scott, uh, we'll all sit down as ourselves, and we'll just goof around playing Axis and Allies and Zombies, or something. That was nuts, by the way. Oh my god, Zombies won. Spoiler. Um, <laughs> it was rough. Um, but we'll, just, we'll sit down, play through a new game, uh, demo it for the audience, goof around, banter, have fun. Uh, and yeah, at a certain point, it just sort of like began going off its own momentum, and now that's just kind of what I do. Is there anything that you haven't done that you want to still do? Like with that channel or? Anything in general. Anything? No, I've fulfilled all of my goals. <laughs> it's all over. It's, it's all over. 27. Yeah, I'm done. It's <laughs> over. This is my last panel ever. <laughs> uh, no, there's lots I still want to do. Like I said, I mean, at uh, yesterday's panel too, I've got five TV pilots that I've written. Uh, that I'm trying to get out there. Um, I've, uh, I've got the drafts and the structures for something like half a dozen films. So I'm, I'm looking to get out there and get content made. I've got three pitches for live shows at GNS. Um, so a lot of coals on the fire and a lot of things that are yet to be developed and achieved. Uh, yeah, this is absolutely just the start, no question. Any other questions from the audience? Anybody? Thoughts? No. Okay. Well, um, what I, I, one of the things I just to, with a couple of the a couple of the, your answers and the way you were describing things, I'm wondering if you consider this a hurdle in terms of the tabletop stuff, for example, and translating that to a larger audience or uh, just a maybe 
larger acceptance is really the, the term that I'm looking for. But um, is it because in a tabletop, it's the individual players, imagine, they're imagining what's going on, it's the story that's in their head, and then much like with, say, you know, a Dungeons and Dragons movie, you're like, no, that's not the way that would be because it's something that you've created in your mind. Is that right. sort of the hurdle, that connection of, oh, no, that's not the I, what you're portraying is not the way I would see it? So my perspective on this kind of content is, I think, a little bit unique because I do come from a very traditional acting and filmmaking background. So I want, for example, I want more scripted content. I want more structured narrative content. Um, obviously, what we do is live RPG gaming. That should never change. But the ability to enrich the world with these sort of like scripted short films, <coughs> these episodic uh, narrative pieces, I love that. And I've always been championing more of that. When we discovered that we were actually going to get the funding and be greenlit to do an actual short film, um, like shot cinematically, the whole nine yards for We're Alive, I lost my mind. <laughs> I was so psyched. And I got to play two characters in one short film, which is so much fun. Uh, but yeah, so my perspective always is, let's do more scripting, more narrative, more traditional um, uh, narrative entertainment, and find that as a way that we can uh, develop the RPG world. Uh, the issue with that is always, of course, funding, typically, because that's very expensive. Whereas sitting around a table and you know just running your mouth and deciding what the world is costs nothing, relatively speaking. Um, but yeah, so long story short, I like to be doing a lot more of that. Um, I, I, I feel like a way in which we can branch out into a larger audience, a larger you know, popularity, is by presenting ourselves in a way that more people can relate to, in a way they're familiar with, which is scripted narrative content. Um, but just marrying that with the live RPG elements that our current audience is already so devoted to, which I, of course, believe should not change. Now, what, where do you think the role in, in the future, trying to look ahead, crystal balling a little bit, the role of technology, and not in so much as, as we discussed with the platforms and the, the distribution, but more on a production side. Um, I mean, the thing that pops into my mind is things like augmented reality that they've done with, you know, games like Pokemon Go and things like that. Could you see something in technology that way that could change the way you produce the, the shows about the games, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, we've already pushed some limits in that regard when we're alive, Frontier. Because, uh, so LA by Night, for example, is streamed live every Friday night on Twitch. So what you're watching is happening as you're watching it. Uh, we're alive is different. We do we pre-tape the entire show. We'll shoot out an entire season over a weekend a very long shooting days. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, which then is all cut up together into roughly 13 episodes, 14 episodes. Um, so with We're Alive, we have the chance to actually go in and produce the series. We can add sound effects, we can add visual effects, we can do more with the set, and we can edit it together in a way that tells a cleaner story that we want to get to. It's still all come up, you know, in the moment, improv, the whole deal, but it gives us a chance to bring some actual post-production into it to really enrich the world, and we do. We have sound effects for all kinds of things, uh, visual effects, just to sort of like up the ante a bit. The ways in which technology will continue to change to, again, just sort of like gild that lily a little bit, is I'm looking for more uh, visual effects, I'm looking for more sound effects, I'm looking for more ways you can create a sort of three-dimensional experience for the viewer, and ideally ways in which we can do uh, scripted content um, more affordably uh, to bring in those other narrative elements. But honestly, most of what makes this genre great is already there, and it's just in the way the players tell the story, the way the GM tells the story. Investing in really good talent for those positions is what makes or breaks a show 
all other affectation of production side. If you get a really good team together, they will paint a picture in your mind that nothing else could possibly replace. So it still will always come down to that, technology or network. Let me ask you this. If you had the opportunity to have a billboard in every major city, one singular billboard, that every person who had dreams or thoughts about doing been trying something, or even just the smallest little thought of trying something in geek culture, and you knew all of those people were going to see that billboard, what would your billboard say? Boy, so it, to promote something, someone could just if it's something to to encourage somebody, or just a, it's, like it's your piece of advice that you can give to everybody, but it's on a billboard. <laughs> <coughs> wow. Uh, hmm. I mean, honestly, in a word, it might be a long billboard, but that's okay. Small print things. I would sum up any and every piece of advice that I could possibly give on interacting with culture in this way. What we do is just about unabashedly, unreservedly loving what you love and doing what you do. And that's the thing that I always thought was the best part of geekdom, is you have full license to just enjoy things and to pursue what you want to pursue. If you want to, you know, write Star Trek fanfic, own it. <laughs> Be the best, man. Like just kill it. Uh, we and you know we we get talented people who do art and do fanfics and do all that kind of stuff for what we do our shows. Um, if you want to be, uh, you know, a, a famous dungeon master, start getting games together. Honestly, send us a freaking reel. Like find some way to get in and get known. It, just, Pursue what you want to pursue, especially in this day and age, more so than any other. There is a lot of noise out there, but there's so much noise because there is so much opportunity to be heard. And anyone who's willing to commit the work and the drive to actually get out there and be heard has the chance to become known for and do professionally whatever they love in any arena. So I'd say it's just love what you love and do what you want to do and literally get it or die trying. Fight for it. Love it. How would you, now that you're, you know, living in this world, you know, waving the flag of, of geek culture and making a living at it, um, how would you convert the uninitiated? What would you tell somebody who has never played a tabletop RPG, maybe isn't into gaming, you know, sci-fi, whatever? Just somebody's like, what? Well, what do you like this stuff? You know, some Bluto that doesn't get it. How would you try and convince them? Convince them to like go and actually play to, a game, or, or to, to give it a try. To try like, like what what is the thing about this world that is enriching to you that you could try and tell somebody? I'd honestly say because this is what appeals to me is I'd say you're never going to have a more entertaining and fulfilling and enriching story as the one you tell for yourself, and there will be nothing more exciting than the adventure you get to live. So that's what I feel is the biggest draw, is you don't, you know, you can watch a movie and you can see some heightened reality fantasy saga take place in front of you that you're just, you know, it, there's this painted glass between you and the adventure, or you can actually live something out. And it, it, there's some growing pain, there's a learning curve, but at the end of the day, you then get to be whoever you want to be, doing whatever you want to do for a few hours, once or twice a week. And I, I find that incredible incredibly alluring. I think that's amazing, the ability to just build any world and exist in it. So I'd say that's a great entry point. Everyone who I've introduced to D&D, and my campaign, my main campaign right now, is mostly people who've never played before. Uh, that's why we designed it. We have one of our directors from GNS who is the GM for the campaign, and his goal with it was let's just only get players who've never played D&D. And it's all people, all staff from GNS. Uh, myself, some of the producers, one of the EPs, uh, all of us who've been around the games, obviously working at GNS for years, none of us have ever played D&D. And the campaign has, has turned into an amazing adventure. It's incredible. And we all just committed to it. So yeah, I mean, if you want to experience an adventure like you've never experienced before, it has to be the story that you tell for yourself. And this is how to do it. 
I just the, literally the re, one of the reasons that popped in my head is because yesterday here at the con and last night there's also a hockey tournament here. And you see those people, and I see this a lot when I go around to cons, you're in a hotel, and then there's there's always, it's Canada, there's always a hockey tournament. And I always think, how could I walk up to one of those hockey parents when they're looking at what's going on down there? And like, you know, come over to the dark side, we have cookies. Like, how, yeah. to, how to convince them to come over, how to, like, as people ask me all the time, because, you know, I'm, I'm like, well, what is it about that that you like? The thing I always say is that everybody's nerdy about something. Yeah, and maybe nerdy thing. about sports. Yeah, or it may be nerdy about hockey. But everybody always is. So. That's the thing is, there's not like a box you have to fit into. The whole, exactly. The whole point of nerddom and geekdom is that, again, we have license to uh, rationally or not love whatever we're into. In you know, in this wise, uh, we don't have to have a reason. You know, I can just be obsessed with, you know. Uh, X, Y, and Z anime, but I can't be every anime. But uh, <laughs> I can love whatever it is I love for no good reason other than I want to and I love it and it's awesome. And that's all the reason that I need it. So if you, you know, if you want that, if you want to enjoy something, you can do it in this community. You don't have to. That's the great part of it. You can also love Star Trek and have no affiliation with the creative community. That's fine. Just you know, accept the fact that you're into this, and that's what we do. Why do you think, like I've literally had the experience of being at a con, just even just being there myself, being at a con, and bumping into somebody that I know, that I didn't know was into this stuff, <laughs> and where they literally go, oh, hey, <laughs> um, what are you doing here? You know, and like they're almost ashamed that they're into this. Where do you think that comes from? The yeah, it's bizarre. Um, it's weird. It is weird. I think it's it's beginning to fade, thankfully, with sure. how broadly accepted this world has become. But I think it's you know it, it comes from a few different places, and I think people have been made to number one. There's this idea that you need to sort of control your love for things, that it's in some way. I don't know, immature or what have you, to just unabashedly be interested in something. To just go all out and be like, I am so all over that. You can't really feel that way unless it's an appropriately like mainstream interest. And even then, you're supposed to maintain some sort of like veneer of aloofness over it. Um, again, it's just a, it's a lot of ways in which people come up with to try and feel superior to other people. And I which comes from their insecurity. Yeah, which comes from their insecurity, absolutely. And so people have had experiences being made fun of for being into anything, whatever it happens to be. And then you develop this idea that, okay, well, you know, it's kind of shameful if I'm really, you know, obsessed with anime or whatever. When, who cares? I don't know. Yeah. Like, whatever. People, it's like, okay, so you've got maybe a housewife in Nebraska who can't stop watching soap operas. Is that different? Like, <laughs> I wouldn't shame her for that either. That's awesome. Like, you, you love the story they're telling. That's dope. And that, I see no difference between that and someone who is, you know, just absolutely obsessed with Full Metal Alchemist or something. Like, you found a story, you found a world and characters that you're just really into, and, you know, you, I'm sure she knows the lore inside and out uh, of, you know, that soap opera. But uh, these things are the same, and it's this slow effort to get recognition for the fact that everyone anywhere is into, to whatever degree, what they are into. But these interests are not different. There's not categories of, if you're really into NASCAR, that's fine. I can be really into Beyblades, and it's the same, it's the same part of the brain, yeah, the same type of sure. interest. So we just have this way of yucking everybody else's yum. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Sorry, you had a question. Yeah, I was gonna I can relate to that because I have some friends who kind of make fun of me that I go to all these different conventions and I tell people, once you've been to a con, then you understand what it's like. Yeah. Then you understand, you know, why I'm so into Superman or why I'm so into Batman or whatever. Just being there and just seeing it with your own eyes. You know, you have to physically be there to understand it. And so that's why I tell people, I says, don't judge. Come once, and if you don't like it, don't go back. 
Totally. I, but I can guarantee you every friend that I've brought in here has been addicted ever since. Yeah. And it's it's a lot of fun, whether it's the small ones or it's the big ones, it doesn't matter. Like I have, I start my friends off at the small ones like this, then I work the way up to like Niagara and then Fan Expo, because then they'll, then they can see what 20,000 people in one building is like, whereas, you know, a couple hundred people in a building. Absolutely. And that's the thing is like, I, I don't feel that a life lived without strong interests, without, uh, just being into things and finding what you're passionate about is really that rich of a life. Whatever those things are. I know people who are just crazy about crocheting. <laughs> it's just their deal, you know? And I'm like, great, like you found your thing. You found what you're about. Uh, and this room here is full of a hundred things people could be about. And any one person who has even no connection to keep them hitherto could go in there and find this one thing like, oh, hey, that's cool. Like, I did that. What, it, even if it's, if it's trinkets or crafts or some type of, you know, nerdy IP, whatever it is, there's something for everyone. And I think it's worth living a life where you find things to really be about. Yeah. Do you feel like in the work that you've done, that I don't, would you have a sense of responsibility or have you had the experience where you've opened that door for anybody? Oh, I've heard from fans, and do you feel a sense of responsibility of like, I, you know, welcome you, you into this world? Absolutely, yeah. Well, the guild had that effect on a lot of people because we would get fan mail and stuff, and then we hear anecdotes of like, you know, teams of plumbers who <laughs> loved the guild, had never played WoW, had no idea what references we were making, but they loved just the humor and the the style of the show. And that would get a lot of people to look at other nerdy influences that we were promoting. So yeah, you know, and to, to make a reference here, uh, and this is also a, a weird aspect of nerdy gatekeeping, because you see shows, because now, again, nerdiness is becoming very mainstream. And so you see shows like Big Bang Theory popping up that really capitalize on that. But then you see a lot, a lot of gatekeeping among nerddom being like, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> like, that's not real right. nerdy stuff, it's pandering. And I'm like, okay, it's written for that audience. Like, I get that, I get that the jokes are sometimes a little bit of a groan in there. Like, it's, it's obviously trying to cater to the nerdy audience and really lean hard into it. But nonetheless, that is still part of geekdom. That is still, a piece of media that is still an IP and that is now catering to introducing people to that greater nerd world and I don't find anything like that to be inherently detracting from what we're trying to do. Any t hey, look, if that show introduced one person to something they didn't know they could love and now they really enjoy, that was worth it. I don't care how, you know, cringe inducing you thought a given joke was, <laughs> I don't care. I thought the first few seasons were funny. It yeah. got weird after that. But, <laughs> but it's like the show is doing its job. It's, it's, uh, it's taking that nerd culture and it's making it approachable. It's, it's giving people a strong entry point to find whatever they do want to be really nerdy about down the line. And I think that's positive. Fantastic. I love it. What are we at for time? Anybody? Any final, final questions? Oh, we got five no. minutes? Yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Um, Let's talk for the just for the last few minutes. Uh, feel free to, to filibuster on just where you see just the, the the future of geek culture. Maybe some patterns you're seeing. Being a little more on the inside, obviously working with you know geek and sundry and and, and being out in, in the cons and everything. What are some little seedlings you see starting to grow up? Some stuff that may be coming that 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 could be big. That could change the way geek culture works. Yeah, I welcome your thoughts. <coughs> Well, I'm definitely looking forward to more cross-media and cross-genre types of content, like marrying the live RPG content with scripted content. You see a lot of things popping up nowadays, like Choose Your Own Adventure shows, uh, which are becoming increasingly popular with Bandersnatch on yeah. Netflix. Um, that Moment When is another award-winning series. It's all Choose Your Own Adventure. Oh. Actually, uh, written, written? He's the head writer. Written and directed, I believe, by Sandy Parikh, who is Zabu in the Guild. Uh, he uh, has this show now uh, featuring, starring the, uh, what's her name? Her, the, the, the woman from the OTNT commercials. 
you totally know her face. Um, but anyway, you see a lot of that. I've also pitched a lot of similar shows at GNS, and they're slowly coming around to the idea of, of pushing the boundaries of what genres they're willing to work in. So I think, and also with the advent, and I wanted to touch on this briefly, is there is an ability for a person to commit themselves to some sort of nerdy creative endeavor, because obviously what I do is it's in the creative side. Uh, to commit themselves to some sort of nerdy creative endeavor, really go all for it, and eventually support themselves on it with the advent of services like Patreon and what have you. A lot of friends of mine who are comics writers, who are uh, creatives, uh, should they, they develop series, they're actors, performers, what have you, uh, use that as a way to continue doing what they do. Because they have a group of people, they've got a fan base that supports them. And it's like, at this time, in this place, there's no excuse to not try to be what you wanted to be all along. And, you know, I've even, at this point, fallen down the rabbit hole of feeling like, oh, acting's not sustainable, what have you. And I went, and I, years back, I literally started an ad agency, uh, an advertising agency, made just ridiculous amounts of money with it, but was miserable 24-7, because you can't act, you can't do what you want to do, you're running a company all day, every day. And so I got rid of it to be able to pursue this full time. Um, and the fact that you can reasonably do that now, if you just commit the work to it, luck is so much not part of it right now. It's literally, all the tools are there, the services, the platforms are there. Get out and start making something of it. Because you can be, right now in 2019, whatever you want to be more than you ever could in the past. It's awesome. Love it. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, sitting in the chat. Dean Carter, once again, it's awesome. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you very much. And you're back over signing after this for a bit, yeah. the rest of the afternoon kind of thing. Go say hi to Vince. Thanks so much. Thanks, y'all.